Well, hey there, you guys. Welcome back to another week at Becoming the CEO of Your Life. I am Janine Alley, and I am super excited because on the podcast today, I have one of my clients with me. Summer Moon is with me today, and I wanted to have her on because I wanted you guys to hear a little bit about her experience with nervous system regulation. So before we get into all of that, I wanted to just kind of introduce you to Summer and all the things first. So Summer, say hi. Hello. Tell us a little bit about you. I am a military spouse. I have been traveling with my husband for about 20 years and we have three kids. We've got a 14, nine and seven year old. And we're originally from Washington state. We're very active in our communities. We're active in the military community. We're active in our church community. And of course, just enjoy having friends and socializing and things like that. And I've loved working with Janine. <laughs> well, that's awesome. I love how you like slip that little plug in there. <laughs> that is awesome. Okay. Well, I wanted to just introduce you to my audience and have you on the show, not only because of the nervous system regulation, but I know that you were kind of hemming and hawing about working with me for a while. So talk to me a little bit about what your life was like before you joined and what were some of the things that, that helped you to kind of take the leap into jumping into the burnout breakthrough? Sure. So I feel like I've kind of always run at the speed of light in life. I've always been a busy person. I've always been like a go-to person for people. And it was fairly easy to maintain until my kids got big enough to have their own lives. And then it's just felt like the plates are crashing off the spindles. And it's been stressful, but I didn't know what to do about it. And so a few years back, I had actually had a call with Janine a number of years ago and knew from that first call that I really related to her, that you and I got along well, like you, you and I kind of thought of similar things. But I had known at that point that while I needed help, I was a little bit in denial and a little bit ashamed. I was a little bit embarrassed that I needed help. I didn't initially have a lot of support from my husband. And so that hindered me a little bit. But I also knew that I kept hitting these, this like invisible hurdle that would just crash me to the ground. Like I felt like I was like running and then this invisible hurdle would come up and I'd like fall flat on my face and I'd get up and I'd pick up the pieces and I would like get back and I would feel like I'm doing okay again. And then I hit this same hurdle and I was sick of hitting this invisible hurdle that I didn't, I just didn't know what it was. I didn't know why I was hitting it or what was triggering it or anything. And so that was kind of like the first step of knowing you needed help. So that was when I first actually went to therapy first, and that was really valuable. I think therapy is something that all people could benefit from. And then I did therapy for a bit over a year. And then we moved here to where we currently live, which is in California. And when we moved to California, I obviously no longer had my therapist because they their licensing issues and things like that. And I was like, you know what? I'm feeling stronger. I'm feeling better. I felt like I wanted to work with you because while the therapist helped me be where I needed to be, I felt like you could take me to the next step. You could help me like apply things in life. You could help show me the path. I think I've told you before, I knew there was a path and I wasn't on it and I didn't know how to step onto the path or what the path looked like. And so I was just ready to go. I had I also had one of my brothers had a medical emergency that was related to like stress induced. I mean, some of it was genetic, but some of it was like stress induced, the emergency part of it. And so that was a big wake up call for me. Like you can't just keep thinking at some point things will get better. You don't have the tools summer to like get you to that place of where you want to be. You need somebody to walk with you. And so yeah. that was when I reached out to you and was like, all right, Janine, I need you. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. So many things that you said were super relatable. So first of all, I can totally relate to that experience of feeling embarrassed to reach out to need help because as people, you and I are both kind of this way. And I think a lot of people can relate to this. We are like go-to people. We are highly capable of getting things done. And so the fact that what we're doing isn't working is kind of humbling for us, I think, because we're the people that are the helpers, <laughs> the people that get helped, right? So that was 
that was also relatable for me and my experience as well. And then also just kind of understanding like the way that you're doing things can get you to a point. I think hustling harder works for people until it doesn't. And then we're just kind of left, like you said, like picking up the pieces and being like, okay, I cannot keep running at this pace and doing things at this pace for the rest of my life. And thinking, I think sometimes like, oh, someday life will slow down or sometimes it'll get better. But this is like a pattern in our nervous system. And you'll know this because as soon as the busy season that you thought has ended, there's another busy season because we find things to do as people who hustle and people who are kind of moving at that pace of the speed of light. Like you said, that's just kind of the way of doing things. So talk to me a little bit more about what else you had tried at this point in your life. I know that you said you had tried therapy, but what are some of the other modalities that you had investigated to help yourself with this hustle? Yeah, that's a good question. So one of the things I did was I knew that exercise and moving my body was helpful both mentally and physically. And so I told myself that if I trained for a half marathon, I could make it a habit and I could make it a lifestyle because I was going to have to train for months and that would create the habit for me and I wouldn't fall off the wagon. So I did, I trained and I was proud of myself. I worked hard and I put in the commitment and I, I was able to stick with it for some time after. And then there was no more like target or end line or anything. And so then it became really hard again. And I mean, I enjoyed running. I can't say that it, it wasn't helpful, but it just wasn't the step I needed. It, you know, it was like, okay, I know I need to move, but I also running was causing more health issues for me because I was already stressed on top of stressing my body. And so I tried going to the doctor and I kept chalking it up to other things, right? So I was like, oh, I'm premenopausal. There's hormone issues. There's got to be all these things that can I can chalk up my fatigue to and, you know, my busy plate. But then I would get down on myself because I'm like, well, I see other people do this and they don't seem to have the health issues I have, or they don't seem to like need a nap. Like it wasn't just, I wanted a nap. I like needed a nap and I couldn't get through the day without one. And I still struggle with that time to time, but I, it's much better. But then the other thing that I often would find myself doing is I've kind of learned through the burnout breakthrough and also through nervous system education that I kind of go into like a freeze state. So I would do all this research and I would learn about all these things, healthier eating, how to take care of myself in all these ways. I'd watch decluttering videos because I knew that if I simplified my space, that it would be better. And I would do all these things that kind of made me feel like I was moving the needle forward, but it, it really was just buffering my brain and nothing was actually happening in my life. I was just having these thoughts that continued to circle around. Yeah. So I did that a lot. That was a lot of it. I think those were kind of like the main things that I tried before I was like, I just can't do this on my own. I yeah. don't have the capability within me. Yeah. And as doers, again, this is something that's very relatable because we think that taking that passive action and we get kind of stuck in that analysis paralysis is actually doing something. But unless you're actually regulating your nervous system, actually you're doing the steps to take care of yourself that way, all of the research in the world isn't going to help you. <laughs> To get it yeah. done. I know that that sounds so obvious when I say it, but how many of you out there are listening to this and being like, oh my gosh, I totally do that. Right. I'm raising my hand. <laughs> if you can't see me on the YouTube video, I am raising my hand right now. Cause I used to do the same thing. It feels like we're getting things done and yet we're actually not taking the steps that we actually need to do to feel better. It's just the same as like knowing exercise is good for us, but not really exercising, right? Or researching the heck out of that and not actually doing it in the end. So I know there's a lot of doubts that go into taking the leap and joining a program. I know one of the things that I think every time that I join a program is this is going to work for me, you know, but what were some of the things that helped you? Well, first of all, walk me through some of the doubts that you had and then what actually got you to pull the trigger and jump in? Yeah. So a lot of the doubts that I continue to battle with, but I think are so common are, I am not good at following through with myself. Like somebody else can put a deadline on me and I'll meet it. But if I give myself a deadline, it often gets bypassed or forgotten or 
maybe not forgotten, but intentionally like shoved aside. So a lot of it was like doubt in myself. Can I follow through? If I'm going to join this, am I going to be able to stick with it? Am I going to be able to make the improvements to make it worth it? One of the other things that I had doubts about was just thinking like, can I change enough for my family to see? That was something that Mm -hmm. initially was really important to me was, am I going to be able to change enough that my kids will notice I'm not so grumpy or my husband will see that my habits are sticking? And while I realize now that none of that actually matters, those were like some of my thoughts coming in of that were holding me back initially of like, Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. I think it does matter. I mean, I think particularly as moms, we're so used to putting our own needs on the back burner. I think we just do this kind of innately a little bit as parents, because of course we do that with our babies, right? Everything that they need comes before what we need as they're young. And there is this transition period throughout their lives between zero to 18 years old, you know, where they leave the house. So I think that is part of what we're considering but one of the things that I have known from the own, my own investments in myself is when I make an investment in myself, it does have kind of a ripple effect on my relationships because I'm making improvements on myself. And so it is going to improve the way that I show up in my life. It's not necessarily a direct thing, but my kids can clearly see like before and after nervous system regulation, they can clearly see it. And this is one of the things I tell my restorative yoga students all the time is this is going to make a huge difference, not just in how you feel, but also in the relationships that you have, your ability to follow through on the things that you want to do, because you're not in this state of panic and reaction all the time in your life. So I just want to put a little plug in for that, because I feel like it's never a waste of time or money when you make an investment in yourself. That's just my opinion, but you have anything that you want to add to that? No, I think that's right. I've never regretted spending money or time or whatever the resource is on myself. It's hard to get there. And I think especially as women, we feel guilty because we feel like, you know, we need to give everything to everybody else. And so why should I take a piece of the pie? But really the, if we're looking at a family unit, like I am a piece of the pie. So, yeah. so I definitely echo your sentiment with that of I've never regretted investing in myself. Sometimes it's hard to like, just make that leap, but I've never thought, oh man, yeah. that was yeah. a waste. Right. <laughs> 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 Right. Okay, good. I mean, I think that's just good for people to hear. So if you needed permission to pull the trigger for yourself, there you have it. Okay. So one of the other things that I wanted to say is you joined me for the wellness retreat. So you were here with me at my house for three days. And I remember we had kind of some text conversations going on back and forth after you got back and you're like, wow, (laughs) like I had no idea. So You want to just tell us a little bit about that experience so people can see like the before and after and how it kind of sunk in like, oh, this is what it feels like to be regulated. Yeah. So prior to the wellness retreat, I hadn't been regulated in probably over a decade, but I didn't know it. So like my normal, what I assumed and thought was regulated was, I mean, I can function I can get the things done. I struggle with anxiety personally. And when people find out, they're like, what? You're like one of the most chill people I know. And I'm like, I know because I have a good mask. I can mask it really well. And I know how to push through it to keep doing whatever needs to be done. The hard thing is it's eating my insides out. Like this last year, I've had so many health issues and it's all internal and it's all like nothing nobody can see. And so what I thought was regulated was often, you know, going back over conversations in my head all the time of like, I could have said this, or what if I added that, or what do they think? And I know that that's pretty natural for us to care about what other people think. And I think there's a little bit of value in, you know, you want to present yourself at your best. So there's a little bit to that, but But I would kind of like get in these like mind cycles and it would feel like sitting down with my kids to color or play or to just like growing up, I love to sit and stare out our front window at the trees. And if I tried doing that in the last several years at my own home, I felt like a buzz inside, like I couldn't do it well. I could do it, but I didn't feel 
it wasn't doing the same for me that it had done in the past. And so when I went to the retreat and I was able to, the theme of the retreat was emotions and feeling emotions. And that's, you know, one of the hard things for me is I don't feel my emotions well because I am so on all the time. I want to just shove them to the side and look at the task at hand and keep performing. And so actually feeling some of those emotions and learning how to and learning some of those steps to get on the path and to stay on the path and to know that regulation isn't the end all be all that it's not going to always be that way that it's that like even relaxation and the hardest thing for me uh, to still do to still think about like i fall into this trap of thinking when i'm dysregulated i'm very aware of it now and I want to push, I want to rush through it. Like, okay, let's get this done. Like I got things to do, you know, like what breathing exercises do I need to do? And that just doesn't work. So, but then coming out of the retreat, I was, we came home on a Saturday night and I flew into LAX and I started to notice on the drive home, like I wasn't stressed out in the traffic that you drive through in LA, but I wasn't thinking too much of it. I was like, well, you know, I'm relaxed. I just had this great weekend, but I got all the way through the driving home. I woke up Sunday morning and I had meetings and I had to get my kids ready. And I was sitting in the pew at church and I was thinking, oh my goodness, I just feel still like inside feels still and that made me realize this is the first time i've felt regulated in daily life in a decade or more i hadn't felt that just true existence i just felt present there was no to-do list going on in my head there was no I've, i need to talk to so and so don't forget this there was no what's happening the next hour. Oh, my kids are chatting, you know, like it was just like hundred percent focused on the moment present. And that was a big epiphany for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You said some really good things in there. The first one is your experience of like the being still I I've said multiple times on the podcast, like when I first started doing yoga, the final resting pose where you're just laying on your back and you're just there in class, the end of class, just relaxing was the worst pose for me because I was always like, I don't have time for this. I got to get up. (laughs) I have so many things to do today. And that is a sign that you're dysregulated. I mean, you think after yoga practice, you'd be regulated. And I think sometimes if you're not regularly regulating your nervous system, it takes a little bit longer to get there. And so we had spent three days or something together. And at the end of that, you're like, okay, now I get it. So if you're at home and you're wondering how to do this, you want to take it in in consistent bite-sized pieces so that you're doing something consistently throughout the week that's helping to soothe and settle your nervous system. The other thing that you were saying is the goal isn't necessarily to be regulated all the time. And some of you may have been confused about that. What she was talking about was the goal isn't to be regulated all the time because we can't be. And that's on purpose. It's by design. We actually don't want to be regulated all the time because when the sympathetic nervous system is activated, that is what literally keeps us alive when it's needed. The problem is when we, when we are experiencing a perceived threat that heightens our senses, puts us on high alert, and we're looking around for danger and all that's happening is you know, we lose our keys or something. And I don't say that's all that's happening. It's usually a compilation of a bunch of things that happen to put us in the state, right? But in reality, we're not in danger, but we don't want to turn this off because there will come a time maybe in life where we need to have that on. So it's this constant ebb and flow between dysregulation and regulation. The problem is most people are dysregulated all the time and they don't even realize it. So tell me a little bit more about what you learned about regulation and how you're doing this now to kind of incorporate these principles that you learn into your life. Like what are some of your favorite ways that you like to regulate your nervous system and what do you do and how do you stay consistent doing it? Yeah. So some of the things I learned is that it doesn't take a lot of time. Like you were saying it, bite-sized pieces are enough. As long as you're doing them consistently and regularly, they will work and that you won't always want to do it. That was another thing I picked up from the retreat is it's not always easy just because you know it's helpful and because when you're done, it feels good doesn't mean 
I'm excited to do it or I have the motivation to do it or I want to do it in the moment. So that's probably the biggest hurdle is just like you think that that kind of stuff is going to come like, oh, I'm excited. I get to go do yoga and I really I'm dysregulated or I'm busy. And so I don't really want to sit to take the time to do yoga because I know it's going to make me be still and that's hard for me. Mm. But some of the favorite things that I like to do. I like to take a hot shower and not like a hot shower, like to get ready for my day. But for example, last night, my kids were wild yesterday and they had lost their screen privileges for the day and they didn't have school. And so by the end of the day, I was pretty frazzled. And so I just went and I took a hot shower last night and I felt so much better. I didn't rush it. I just took my time. I kind of like shook my body out in there. And so that's one of my favorite things. I like to go on walks. And when I walk, I prefer to not listen to anything. It's fun to listen to things sometimes, but I actually just prefer like my own thoughts or my, like, I find that when I walk without listening to something, I can sometimes get to that quote unquote, nothing box to where I couldn't really tell you what I thought about. I just am walking and just enjoying the fresh air. I didn't know what restorative yoga was prior to the retreat, but I found that having experienced that now, that that is something that I really love. And yoga doesn't always have to be an hour long practice. Like I found videos that are 15 minutes or Mm -hmm. you can find a meditation that's short. You know, there's so many meditation apps or like, even if you have an Apple watch, there's like a breathing thing where you just watch the circles for 30 seconds to 60 seconds, whatever it is. And then another big one for me is journaling and journaling looks different for me at different times. But as far as regulation goes, I find that the biggest help for me is actually like the thought download that you teach. There's no rhyme or reason to it. It doesn't have to like make sense to anybody. It's just like verbal vomit or written vomit, I guess. And so that is actually the journaling practice that helps me the most when I'm feeling dysregulated. I like journaling for other reasons and in other ways, but when I'm feeling out of sorts, if I can just get every thought, they like don't match, they don't back to back looks really weird, but it's just, it's so helpful for me. And that really doesn't take that long. It feels, I feel like going into it, you think it's going to take a long time, but really it's just a couple minutes. Yeah. Yeah. It takes like five minutes to do a brain dump. (laughs) I mean, if it's extensive, I mean, sometimes mine are longer than that, but on day-to-day maintenance stuff, it's just pretty, it's not a big commitment. So as you were talking, there was something that came to mind that I just want to hit on. So I actually had done restorative yoga before I had like a continuing education for my own yoga teacher certification. We have to do education hours to stay current with that certification. And so before I had taken some restorative classes and I'm like, this is almost painful. I mean, it's feels good to just relax like that, but I see the benefits in moving around. And so for me to just like huddle up with some pillows, I'm like, I mean, again, like I don't have time for this. Right. So the thing that was help, most helpful for me was understanding the benefits of why that kind of a practice is really helpful. Cause so when I could see like, Oh, I can totally see how this makes sense with the body and what I know. And also the stress and overwhelm that I'm experiencing and how that calms that and how this benefits my relationships with people. Like I was able to just really embrace the practice after that, but I was just showing up to restorative class. I'm like, Oh my gosh, <laughs> get me out of here. And I've actually had students before I did kind of these one-off restorative classes through through the summertime before people would commit to like a, like a package of restorative yoga classes. And I was noticing in there that people would just like pop in and out. Like I would have a lot of new faces throughout the weeks because they weren't really understanding the benefits of practice. And so then I would start, you know, change my approach a little bit and explain why this is so beneficial during that hour of time so that they could really understand. So it all comes down to nervous system regulation and getting yourself into a space where you're noticing the benefits. So tell me a little bit more about some of those benefits that you've experienced because of the regulation that you've practiced doing and how this has benefited you besides just your stress. Like how has this had a ripple effect in your life? I've noticed, like I said, it's a very hard physical feeling to describe, but I physically feel different. Like I feel 
lighter, but it's not like just my shoulders. It's almost like the gravity is like less heavy on me. And I feel like things that would typically maybe not set me off, but kind of just get a thought going doesn't really anymore. It just kind of like goes off me like the rain drops down my shoulder type thing. But I also feel like my fuse is longer. So my kids, I can get through their dysregulation without me triggering into like anger or like matching their energy. I'm able to stay calmer and I have more energy. Like that is one of the biggest things for me because like I mentioned earlier, Fatigue is something that I really struggle with. And so when I'm able to regulate, I don't feel the need for a nap. I don't feel like I have to lay down. I can get through. And I think it's because my anxiety and my thoughts, they run so fast and so hard. It it exhausts me. Yes. It physically is exhausting to have those kind of thoughts all the time. And so when I'm regulated, they're quieter and they're just not as, as in my face. And so I can like move about my day easier. I don't feel as overwhelmed. And so also my physical, I really struggle with like a hunched, hunched shoulders and hunched posture. And when I feel regulated, I notice that I can walk taller and it's not like a confidence thing, although it does give me confidence, but it's like physically, my body is just able to stand more upright. Like it's not downtrodden as much. Yeah, totally. Yeah. It's interesting how these like little things that you wouldn't even think about are uh, manifestations of a regulated nervous system. I've also noticed like with my kids, like when they're dysregulated, I don't freak out. Like oftentimes, because we often feel like even our emotions themselves are things that we feel threatened by. And so if we're not used to building emotional resistance, we're constantly in the state of dysregulation. Anytime we feel anxious or anytime we feel overwhelmed, that kind of sends us into this loop of like, oh my gosh, the sky is falling, right? It's like one little thing like sets you off for the rest of the day. But when you are regulated, you can see this playing out in your, in your kids' lives. Like, let me give you an example of this. So my daughter, Emma, started high school this year. It's the first time she's ever gone to public school. She's been homeschooled all of her life. And so it's a little bit of a shock. (laughs) That probably doesn't surprise any of you. But for a while, and she still does this periodically, she'll come home and she just cries and cries and cries. And at first I'm like, oh my gosh, we've made the wrong decision. This is, she's not ready for this, you know, and it would kind of like send me when I wasn't in this space of regulation. But now I'm like, it's okay, because actually tears and crying is your body's way of getting regulated. So I just let her cry it out. We just talk about it. I just let her hash it out with me if she needs to, or by herself or whatever. And then she's breathing and then she's back to herself and she's able to think clearly. I won't let her do her homework or anything because she's like, I have to get this done. I'm like, actually, we don't (laughs) have to get this done right now. You need to take care of yourself. Let's take a moment. Let's get a snack. Let's get hydrated. Let's talk this through and doing the things that I can to help her to get to that space where she feels a little bit more soothed and settled. And now she's ready to get to work instead of continuing to force and push like we all do, like what you were talking about a little bit earlier. So that's one of the ways that we can get regulated. I mean, we all feel a little bit better after we've had a good cry, right? It's just like, you know, (laughs) so anyway, I appreciate you saying that because it's kind of one of those things that you're just like, I know I'm going to feel less stress, but you don't realize like how much that affects everything else that you're doing in your life when you are not overwhelmed, when you're not burned out, when you're not experiencing that exhaustion all the time. And you're totally right. These emotions that we have throughout the day and the thought loops that continue to spin are exhausting for sure. So I appreciate you saying that and bringing that up. Okay. So last thing I want to ask you, what are some of the big takeaways, just name three, three big takeaways that you have experienced from being inside of the burnout breakthrough? Mm, That's a good question. So three takeaways. One is I am human and human beings are not always on like human life is hard. That is one thing that I think logically I knew, but it smacked me in the face in the burnout breakthrough is that I am a human being and it's okay 
that's like been one of my mantras since the wellness retreat is it's okay to feel down. It's okay to feel amazing. It's okay to be tired. It's okay to feel stressed. And that's just human existence. And so that <laughs> is one of my biggest takeaways. Another big takeaway would be it's hard. This stuff is like because it has positive outcomes and because you feel good and it's all like growth, I just kind of assumed that this kind of growth wouldn't be hard. I thought that this would kind of just naturally fall into place, but it's not. Consistency is not easy and I don't always want to do the things that I know are good for me. So I have to remind myself like sometimes it's like when you know what your kids need, but they are saying they don't need that. Like You just kind of got to be that loving compassionate parent. And then that's kind of leads into the third thing is there are like different voices that we have in our head and compassion is not natural for us to give to ourselves. And that is something that I still struggle with, but I'm so excited to get better at and stronger at is compassion for ourselves is like such a key point. You can't get to feeling regulated all the time. You can't meet your higher self goals if you don't have compassion for yourself, you're just not going to reach that. So that was probably my third thing is I kept thinking, well, I don't have to like myself to get there. It's just like everything else in my life. I feel like I could just power through, like, let's just keep bulldozing through the obstacles until we get to the end in this burnout breakthrough. And in this life, you have to, you have to find your compassion for yourself. Yeah. So good. All right. Is there anything else that you want to add? Anything that we missed? No, I just, the burnout breakthrough has been a, an amazing tool for me. It's been great to work with you. It's your knowledge is fantastic. Your encouragement is great. I never feel judged. I've loved that. I've had, you know, you talk about shame and it still feels hard sometimes to share some of that shameness, but group calls and individual calls, it's always been, I've always felt safe. Like I could let anything on my chest out. And that has felt good. And I think in turn has helped me regulate like, Oh, I can, yeah. there is a place to get this out. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Cause if you're in that shame, if you're feeling shame, it's a fight or flight response because you just want to get out of it. Right. Cause the judgment is so fierce. So, yeah, well, I'm glad that you felt that way. And, and thank you so much for sharing that. And thank you for sharing all of your wisdom on the podcast today, my friends, it is Thursday. This podcast episode is going live on Thanksgiving day. You have until Monday to join me right now for the Black Friday special that is happening right now. So if you are on the fence, get your buns into the program. There is even a payment option on there, a payment plan option for the burnout breakthrough. If you're feeling like, e, this is not a great month for me to join, just get in there, <laughs> come join me. It's going to be great. I can't wait to work with you. So now is the time. Although, of course, you're going to have opportunities in the future. This isn't going anywhere. So if you're hearing this later or or after the new year or whenever you get a hold of this episode, you have the opportunity to join me. So keep your eyes open for those enrollment times and everything. All right, you guys have a beautiful Thanksgiving. I am grateful for each one of you. I know that I don't know you by name, but I really appreciate you tuning in and listening. And I am grateful that this adds value to your life in some way. So you keep coming back and I hope that you guys have a wonderful week and we'll catch you guys in December. See ya. Bye.